faith is the basis for Christian living. Faith is how we begin to know God. Faith grows that we might truly experience his work in our lives. Faith is not something that can be given to another. They must exercise it themselves. But today, we have become, in our Western culture, so scientifically minded that at times we have become blinded to the importance of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, which has been entitled by many, Heaven's Hall of Faith, defines for us the importance of faith for the Christian life. For he says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the means by which we get to know God and by which we please God. It is the basis upon which we embrace his promises. Today, people don't want often to live by faith. They want to read the circumstances of life. They want to put out the proverbial fleece and say, well, God, if you want me to do this or you want me to do that, then prove this to me, this fleece or that fleece. And they draw back from simple faith and trust. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11. And let us look at a biblical definition of faith and what faith teaches us about life and some of the people who lived by faith and were rewarded by God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The word assurance in a very uh, concrete, uh, literal sense was a, a guaranteed deed of ownership. It was an entitlement that uh, a person was either granted or which they purchased. It was something that a person had that in a sense guaranteed that the other person was serious about the relationship or the ownership or the partnership in this event. An illustration today might be something like a young man giving a young woman a diamond ring. Now, the bigger the diamond, I would suggest the bigger commitment, correct? Sometimes those big diamonds aren't possible because of economic reasons. But uh, when a young woman receives a ring from a young man and there's a stone on it and it represents some sacrifice, there's a sense of assurance or confidence that this young man is really serious about this decision. Another example today would be, uh, for instance, the title deed that we have uh, to our home or even to a car. You know, when you buy a car or you buy your home, you do get a deed, don't you? That deed is an absolute guarantee that someday, hopefully, you will have complete ownership and possession of it. You don't want to uh, take the loan on that car for too many years these days as they depreciate. But when we have a deed, when we have something of a solid, solid identification of commitment, then there is a great assurance that comes with it. And by faith, we can have confidence that what God has promised, what we hope for is going to come about. Faith provides us that kind of assurance of the truthfulness and hopefulness in the things of God. 
faith also provides for us a conviction about things that are not seen. The word conviction is a a legal technical term. It's uh, when a prosecuting attorney would put before the court exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C, exhibit D, proving the case of the prosecutor. Faith helps us to have a great conviction, a conviction about things that we haven't seen but we truly believe in. I've never seen heaven, but I believe in it. I've never met God visibly, but I believe in him. Jesus Christ says he's coming again someday, and by faith, I hope and expect it to come. And therefore, I celebrate a communion service. Yes, faith gives us a title deed. It gives us a case, a legal case or certainty that even though I have not seen the thing, I believe it to be true. Today, we would say something like, where there is smoke, there is what? Fire. You may not see the fire itself, but if you see the smoke, the evidence of it, you know that somewhere there must be a fire. And so our Christian faith is not a blind faith. It is a faith that is built upon solid evidences, as the writer of Hebrews will tell us. Hebrews 11 verse 2 says, For by it, by faith, the men of old gained approval. Quite literally, it says, the men of old had a testimony about themselves. They had a good reputation. Uh, People of faith should be people with a good testimony or a good reputation. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. By faith, in obedience to God, we build a life, we build a character, we build a testimony that will be seen by others and rewarded by God. Hebrews 11.3 goes on, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Yes, it's by faith that we understand that God created the heavens and the earth by his word. And the word that is used here is God's spoken word. You remember in Genesis, God simply said, let there be, let there be, let there be, six times. He spoke and things came into existence. Psalms 33, 6 says this, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And yet our scientists continue to hope that on Mars or some other planet they will somehow find water so that they can somehow believe a lie that it all just came into existence without God. By faith, he says, we understand. The word to understand means to understand with our minds more than with our senses. And when you look at our creation, when you look at this world, there is a rational reason to believe in intelligent design, to believe in a creator. When we look at the rotation of the earth, the atmosphere, how gravity works, how the ecology of our earth is all working together, the composition of an atom, the life cycles of earth, you must come to an intelligent understanding that these are not just by chance, but where there's a creator, 
where there's a creation, there's a creator. Where there's a design, there's a designer. One of the interesting things is that science cannot explain the origin of matter, can they? They can try to explain how maybe matter has evolved, how matter has changed, but they can't tell you where matter came from in the beginning. How does something come from nothing? The other thing that science can't seem to explain is the consciousness of the soul, the reflective nature and being of humanity. They cannot explain the animation of life, what we call the soul, or how a metaphysical, what appears to be both a physical and a spiritual world exists. Now, I cannot scientifically explain it either. But neither am I going to deny the obvious existence of it, which science must do to eliminate God. For me to acknowledge a supreme being, for me to acknowledge a God, for me to acknowledge intelligent design is an intelligent thing to do. And by faith, I believe that these things have happened. Yes, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared. They were prepared. They were organized. They were planned. They were instrumentalized together by God's spoken word. And the things that we see came from nothing. Beginning in verse 4, the writer of Hebrews is going to now speak about the men of old, the women of old even, as he will include Sarah and others, as to how their faith helped them to embrace and to know God. In verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he, Abel, obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying or indicating about his gifts And through faith, though Abel is dead, he still speaks today. You remember the story in Genesis chapter 4. In the course of time, it says that Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as he wanted to give an offering to the Lord. Cain was primarily a farmer. He was a gardener. Abel, of course, was a keeper of the flocks. And so Cain brought what he wanted. Abel brought, apparently, what God wanted, what God had ordered. It says, Abel brought the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And you know the story. The result was that Cain decided to kill his brother Abel. His anger turned against Abel. It turned against God, and his desire was to eliminate the one who was a testimony or witness against him. Hebrews 9 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Matthew 23, 35, Jesus spoke to the hypocrites of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who would end up murdering him. And he said, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, Abel being the first person killed in the book of of Genesis, and Zechariah being the last one killed in the book of Chronicles, that was the Bible of the Jewish people, theirs started with Genesis and ended with Second Chronicles. He says, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, you have always been killing God's people, trying to eliminate the witness or the testimony of God. Yes, Abel offered a better sacrifice. People today want so much to create their own worship system whether it be a religion a cult or or a 
Indian uh, nature worship or whatever, all people want to worship something. But by faith, we embrace the God of the Bible and we worship him the way he tells us. The second person in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. He was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before taking up, he was pleasing to God. Yes, Abel worshipped God, and Enoch walked with God. He walked with him in a pleasing life. It doesn't say much about Enoch, but in Genesis 5.21, it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years. He had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. What was Enoch known for in his faith? He was known in his faith because Enoch sought to please God. Unfortunately, today, churches and people have gotten it backwards. Today, people expect that God is to please them. So much of religion, so much of even of, of Christian preaching and teaching is about, uh, is about engaging God by faith so that God does everything to please you. And if God doesn't please us the way we want to be pleased, then we are disgruntled. We've got it backwards. Enoch had it right. Ephesians 5.10 says that as believers, we are by faith to try to learn to do that which is pleasing to the Lord. 1 John 3.22 says, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, said this, Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God, just as you are actually doing, that you should excel at it even more and more. Yes, by faith, we seek to please the Lord. Not to somehow say, God, what are you going to do for me today? But God, what will I do for you this day? By faith, Enoch walked with God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yes, we can mechanically go to church. We can mechanically go to a catechism. We can mechanically go to a Bible study. We can follow the traditions and follow the heritage, and we can have our wonderful Christmas uh, traditions. But if we are not walking by faith, seeking to please him, then it is all for nothing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I think of some of the great philanthropy of this day. Billionaires giving away billions of dollars. And it means zippo, zero. Because if it is not by faith, and if it is not in the name of Jesus Christ, if it does not have eternal value, then it means nothing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is. You've got to first believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Yes, we have a very personal God who is very personally interested in us and he plans on rewarding us for our service to him throughout this lifetime. Paul said it this way in Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, 
since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ whom you are serving. Galatians 6, 9 says this, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Yes, everything that we do, we can do for the glory of God. Whether it's uh, preaching, whether it's singing, whether it's uh, doing children's church, whether it's in the nursery, whether it's teaching a Sunday school, whether it is meeting a client at your corporation, whether it is uh, working in that uh, factory, what, whatever it is, every act of life, our study, our education, every act of life can be done as an act of worship to God if we do it in the name of Jesus and we do it as his representative. Yes, we need to believe that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. We are his ambassadors here on earth. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen. What were those things not yet seen? <laughs> Called raindrops, right? Raindrops. Prior to the flood, there was no rain on earth. The earth was watered with a heavy dew. When uh, Noah tried to explain to his uh, community that uh, a thunderstorm and rain and everything was going to come, what are you talking about? We've never had that ever happen before. What are you talking about, Noah? By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark, which was a tremendous personal expense of years of work and years of investment for the salvation of his whole household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Yes, by Noah's godly, faithful response to the revelation of God, his witness and testimony was a judgment upon the rest of the world. By faith, verse 8, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive from an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Let us remember that Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees, the civilization of the day, the great city between the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, the area of modern-day Iran and Iraq. He was called to leave the greatness, the beauty, and the pleasures of the city to go to the desert. He left the good things of the world behind him. Verse 9, by faith he lived as an alien, not in the sense of uh, Star Wars aliens, but as a stranger, an immigrant in the land of promise. As in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Yes, by faith, Abraham left the greatness of the city, the securities of a building, all the convenience of it, to live in a temporary dwelling of tents throughout the land of Palestine. Why? Verse 10. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and whose builder is God. Something that he'd never seen, nor would he see it. But somehow Abraham passed on to Isaac, and Isaac passed on to Jacob, this uh, life of faith, this commitment to obedience to God. And we know that they weren't perfect, and we know that they made lots of mistakes, but by God's grace, the boys caught it eventually, didn't they? And they followed the promise also. And they turned their back upon the world. And they followed God, even though it was a difficult path. And then verses 11 and 12. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life. 
She was way beyond childbearing and had not had a child as of yet, over 50 years of marriage. But she considered God faithful, who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, this Abraham, and him as good as dead at that, being a hundred years, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and the innumerable as the sand which is on the seashore. Yes, by faith, the people of old had a testimony of God's faithfulness and blessings to them. You see, obedience and faith is a decision of the mind and the will and not of the emotions. If you were to put ourselves back in their sandals, you might say, well, emotionally, this is not the pleasurable decision to make. This is not the thing that I would like to do. This is not the thing that looks like it's in my best interest to, to uh, spend all that I have and spend all of my energy building an ark for a, a, a thunderstorm that I've never seen, to uh, deny myself the pleasures of the city, to go out in the desert and follow a God who's going to tell me and show me a promised land that I'm not going to possess right now and, and a city that is somehow... Uh, in the heavens and not on earth and I'm going to get it someday <laughs> that I'm going to have a child after all of these years when I haven't and yet who wants to be raising children when you're 75 or older things that were not uh, emotionally uh, something that one would jump out and say yeah that's a, that's a good deal God uh, appreciate you pleasing me like that no obedience so often Faith so often is a decision of the mind and the will to do God's word and then to let him bless us and reward us as a result. We need to help people understand in this season that they can only know God by faith. Understanding that they are sinners in need of God's Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we under, need to understand, too, that throughout our life we embrace God by faith, not waiting for God to please us, but for us seeking to be pleasing to him. Let's pray. As the ushers will prepare to receive our offering, Bruce, you can come and lead us in our morning family prayer.